The song introducing this episode of The Villain Podcast is called Cherries from Andy Campbell. I don't know what first led me to Dive Bar, but I'm glad I found it. The song and the release by the same name is fantastic, bringing with it an ability to create a set of visuals in the mind that accompany a blend of jazz and pop among so many other influences. Albeit her debut solo release, Dive Bar wasn't the first time that I'd heard Annie, though. That came over the past several months where I was exposed to a variety of collaborations released with Be Well. Yeah, yep. So I actually met Be Well through he. When I first moved to Des Moines, I was working with a group called um, the MFK Trio, who I then played with for like years after that. Um, but when I first started working with them, um, the keyboard player in that band, Fred, knew Be Well. And Be Well was looking for a group to book at Woolies for like this jazz brunch. And so Be Well hit us up and that was the first time I met him. And then from there, he asked me to like feature on one of his songs. And then that's how I met um, Anthony AM Mixes. Uh, and yeah, so I, I did a couple songs with Be Well and I recorded my, my first single when I released Before You separately. Um, I recorded that with Anthony and yeah, he's the, I love the Des Moines hip hop scene. A lot of those, a lot of those artists have like kind of taken me in, even though I'm not a hip hop artist, obviously, but yeah, be well, is, he's given me a lot of opportunities and chances to perform and make music with him. So there resides one of the interesting elements to Annie's music its ability to rest slightly outside the reaches of easily definable genre labels. Speaking with Ryan O'Ryan this past fall, Annie made comment of a Linda Ronstadt documentary she'd seen, and I think there's an argument to be made for a comparison between the two, stylistically. In her own words, though, Annie connects her sound to a variety of different genre types that she feels describe the style she's aiming for. I've recently been describing it as um, pop, jazz, or like, like soul I feel like soul kind of like encapsulates it because it's, I don't know. I would hope that you can feel like soul throughout the whole thing. That's kind of like what I want. Um, but yeah, it is, it's hard to pin down. So I feel like I can tend to write more um, bluesy or more even like folk, um, like folk country sometimes, some of the stuff I've written. But um, yeah, I think, I think I like was a little scared of the pop genre and like what that means. But I think that just kind of like I write songs in like pop style of like the way there's a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, like um, like in the way that I'm trying to make them catchy. So I think that kind of makes sense. But yeah, I think I think there's obviously a big jazz influence. There's a quote on Annie's website which says, Annie uses her training in voice, piano, drums, and arranging, along with her exceptional songwriting to tell stories and evoke feelings as universal as they are specific. Training is such an interesting word to think about when considering the arts, but that doesn't make it any less common or applicable. In Annie's case, she spent time at Southwestern Community College's professional music program, where she was, at one point, honored with a Vocal Jazz Soloist Award to receive part of that training. I started going to school there. I didn't know how to read music. I I sang my whole life, but I never really played piano or any instruments or anything. And then, yeah, when I started going there, it's like a, a vocational school. So it's like you do everything. I was taking bass lessons, drum lessons, like totally, at like everything. I took like studio recording lessons and all kinds of crazy shit. So yeah, that was definitely where I got my training. They didn't teach much about songwriting there, but I did learn a lot about arrangement and I feel like I try to like implement that into my stuff. But yeah, that was definitely where I got my, a lot, my pretty much all of my training was from there. Listening to Dive Bar brings about an interesting sense for its place in Annie's timeline. On one hand, it's a product of this broader musical track she's been on, while on another, it's a very personal creation focused on a narrow window of time. One of the aspects of that side of things comes with the inclusion of a close friend, Deborah Huseman, who guides Dive Bar by narrating its journey. So she, um, she's one of my like closest friends. We work at the same daycare together. 
And um, she's like a seven-year-old woman who is the most absolute hilarious person in the world. And she, she just like is very special to me. And I also love her speaking voice. And I knew that I wanted, um, when my friend Jazz and I were writing the interludes, I just knew that I wanted like an older person's voice. And I just knew, like I knew I wanted her right away. She kind of gave me a hard time about it. And I didn't think it was going to happen a few times before recording, but finally she said yes and we got it done yeah she's awesome i love her i feel like this speaks to a sort of conceptual tightrope that annie's walking with her music on this release balancing between two sides of the self personal and the performer when i was recording the songs i think i was a little bit i really like when albums tell a story and when it seems like cohesive and i was a little bit concerned about like the cohesiveness of the album because all the songs are so different and because like my songwriting style can be so different and sometimes I'm writing about personal things. Sometimes I'm just like making up random shit. I was talking to my friend about that and how I want, I always wanted to have an interlude because I like when there's a little space between some of the songs and it's not just like song, 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 song happening. Um, And I was talking to her about it and we decided to write something sort of just about like a storyteller and sort of like introducing me that was kind of the objective was like, this is my first project. And I feel like it's like really important to know the artist and kind of like get get a little glimpse into like what they have going on. So that was kind of like our way to sneak that in was to say that I'm a storyteller and that baseline, all the songs are about just how they're about stories. If that makes sense. It's more of a balancing act than a contrast between the personal and persona, from how I see it, and one that is readily on display throughout Annie's music videos as much as the tracks themselves. Prior to speaking with Annie, this stuck out to me, straddling those two lines, simultaneously presenting very personal and personable music at times, while crafting this character of Annie at others. To me, that's what Deborah's introduction does. It reconciles these multiple aspects of Annie which are present, the self and the character she's presenting as the singer. So I think the Cherries music video and Cherries is all very sort of like this character, like you're describing, like, like I am on the cover and like, like I present when I'm performing sort of like a songstress. And that's, I don't know, just like the jazz kind of vibe. But I think what I wanted to do with the, with the movie music video was like, make it a little goofier because I am like a very unserious person. And I feel like that doesn't always come across when I'm like singing on stage, being serious about it. I don't know. I think I have two pretty different sides of myself. I had maybe there's three because a, a lot of my music is like emotional. A lot of my unreleased stuff is really personal. I think I think this album was like my least personal album that I'll probably put out because the stuff I'm working on next is like very much so more about my life and it's like a little harder to release. I think it's fun to not really know what you're going to get. And so I think that's kind of where I'm at with it because I feel like I'm so many different things at one time. So it's fun to be able to be different, all different things, you know? Her song, Before You, is a great example of this falling back into a second, or maybe a third side of herself, as she referred to it, as it pulls from personal experience and reflecting on the difficulties of growing by way of troubled relationships. This isn't to say that each side is equally as comfortable, however. As the more personal her songs are, the harder it is they are to release into the wild. I think it becomes a little easier to release the more intense emotional stuff if it's like sprinkled with those those little songs that I'm making up that are not true, you know? Yeah, it is. Because otherwise, oh God, all my music would be so depressing. Oh, all of it. (laughs) You'd be crying the whole time. It wasn't until watching the music video for Before You that I connected with the song's lyrics, which to me speak to a different idea than I think they were intended to. There's a line in the song where Annie sings, Wish I could say it was all your fault. Yeah, you made the trap, but I'm the one that got caught. For me, this lyric has an element of self-sabotage and nudges my own personal history riddled with countless moments where I failed to protect myself from situations that I knew weren't good for me. From her perspective, though, Annie takes a little different angle on the line and how she relates it to her songwriting journey. I wrote that song after 
a very like tumultuous situation ship it was never a relationship but it was like constantly on and off I think I like knew that this person that I was seeing was not necessarily like good for me or like good at communicating or um like honest with me but I like continued to put myself back in that situation because I liked him a lot I I have a hard time writing songs like angry songs about people because I I try to not hold on to that type of anger or blame but I just felt in that like in that moment when I wrote that song I was just so like so angry and I let myself be mad a little bit I think as the song comes off more sad than how I wrote it when I was like actually like pretty angry but saying that you miss who you were before you met someone is like kind of a lot and so um I hung on to that one for a while too but I I knew that I had to release that song first just because it is like intimate and I wanted the first music video to be intimate in the same way. And that music video was inspired by an Alanis Morissette music video where for um, head over feet, where she's just kind of like sitting there and uh, it's like really intimate. And I love that. Beyond Alanis, Janelle Monae's cold war music video presents itself as something visually similar where it creates a visual vacuum isolating the individual and amplifying the expression of self that comes through the song's lyrics. This is captured in Annie's video as well. Elsewhere in our discussion, Annie made a reference to a musical similarity between a track of hers and Chris Isaac's Wicked Game, which itself has a wildly provocative music video. And elsewhere throughout the release, there are a wide variety of other musical influences which Annie calls upon. I get a lot of inspiration from, I love... Sade's instrumentation and her music I love like the bossa nova feel that's kind of like where cherries came from my biggest inspirations are Adele and Amy Winehouse for sure like vocally I think I write I pull inspiration in my writing from Lana Del Rey Um, I'm a big fan of hers as well I also love Alanis Morissette and I also love Fiona Apple a lot of just like female singer-songwriters yeah, I don't know. I think every song, like when we sat down, it was like, okay, this song has a very different vibe from the rest. Who are, like, what do we want to sound like? What, what are the um, inspirations? I think Movie was inspired a lot by, like, Anderson Pack and Bruno Mars, uh, like, the Silk Sonic kind of sound, that, like, sort of 70s, like, sleaze kind of music, you know? I don't know what Dive Bar is. I think it's kind of a, I think that song is like maybe the most me, most my style. And Cherries too. I don't know. I I pull inspiration from so many places that I think that's why it's kind of all over the place. (laughs) Like genre wise. My older stuff, I was definitely, I mean, in that song Lavender, I referenced like a Lauryn Hill line. I love Lauryn Hill and a lot of like R&B singers. And I was, when I was playing with the group that I was with, we were playing a lot more R&B style music, a lot of like Jill Scott, stuff like that. Before You also has an element of reconciling a younger self with the present, which the video speaks to by including footage of Annie as a child. I think that song, it was written about a relationship, but I think that it could also go, it could have multiple meanings. And I think that song also means to me, like, you know, people that I grew up with and people I grew up around that, you know, were not kind to me. And so that like showcasing like my, my like younger self in that way is like a little tribute to that. Cause I love when songs have multiple meanings. I think like you can miss who you were before a lot of people. Yeah. It was just a little tribute to my younger self in that way. Miles Away Before You is Movie, which also bears a contrasting video showcasing an entirely different side of Annie's personality. It's silly and sexy and it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it creates a story of a character as opposed to drawing upon individual experience and painting a very personal picture of her feelings. Given how all these different sides of her are captured visually throughout these videos, I was curious if there was one that stood out as a personal favorite. I do really like the movie music video because it was so fun to make. Um... But I, I don't know, Cherries kind of has a special spot for me, too, because it was kind of my first time being more, like, artistic with it. And uh, it was really fun to figure out, like, what the style was and to, like, find other, like, older clips that fit in with kind of the theme. So, I don't know. I, I really enjoy making videos. 
And I think it's, like, important to have, like, visuals that go along with stuff. So I don't know what my favorite would be. I think they all have, like, a special spot, you know? Annie referred to last year's Pam and Tommy miniseries when drawing upon influences for the song, adding that the video's aim was something of a Las Vegas wedding vibe. But again, there was a line being straddled using her creativity and putting this idea out there, while also recognizing potential downsides of utilizing a character that might reflect negatively, or at least in an awkward way, upon the person she is in her day-to-day life. It was, yeah, that was so fun. I loved, I don't know, the song is like very not serious, and so I I thought if, I don't know, it's easy to go like super raunchy with that song, and I didn't want to go like all that way, because the song itself is inappropriate. And I work at a daycare still, so it's kind of like a weird balance for me to, I don't know, not be doing too much, you know? Aside from the concepts behind the album stand a musically robust release, Annie not only sings on Dive Bar, but adds piano on its title track. So I played keys on Dive Bar, and then I originally, like the first version of Before You, I played keys on. And then I think Eric, the producer, ended up playing keys on before you in the studio because I was singing at the same time. I think that's all I played keys on on this album. We didn't have a super key heavy album, which is funny because I wrote all of them on piano. But there was a couple songs that called for like organ. And so Brian, I think actually Eric played played on those too. So yeah, I only played on Dive Bar technically. But that one, I wanted to play keys on at least one song to kind of showcase like how I write. And I don't know, I love like stripped back versions of things. And I think it's a lot more intimate that way. So I wanted to like start out the album in a really like intimate way. The release also features a wide array of guest players, which inspired some curiosity about whether there was much of a collaborative process behind the tracks on Dive Bar. I think I wrote a majority of them. I think, I don't know, I think they're kind of all over the place. I wrote the last song, um, Black and Blue, Blood and Sea. I wrote that probably like two or three years ago. But I wrote Dive Bar probably one and a half years ago, maybe. I wrote that song when I was playing a lot more often with with a group that I was with. Yeah, we ended up calling ourselves, it was like MFKAS for the rest of our initials. So we were the motherfucker for a while. Yeah, and I wrote that song kind of, it was on the end of working with them. I think I quit that band shortly after that. I was just like so burnt out. And there was several issues within like members of the band. But it's all like worked out now and we're all good. But yeah, it was rough there for a minute. In terms of the songwriting and arrangement on the album, what developed was a little bit more of a collaborative vibe as the recording progressed. But the release still primarily revolved around a direction and tone set by the singer. With this album, I wrote all of it myself. And all the stuff I've done in the past, I've just written alone. There was a collaborative element on Before You when we recorded that song for the album because the producer I worked with, Eric, wanted to re-record that song for the album, but I didn't really want to at first. It was just going to be like four songs or whatever, and then it would have definitely been like EP that way. But I I don't know. He, he kind of convinced me to like give it a new life, which I'm really glad that we did. But so we kind of worked together on that one, and he gave me some ideas about changing up the some of the arrangement of that song and the, I don't know, we took some stuff out and made it a little shorter. So, but other than that, yeah, I pretty much just wrote it all myself and brought it to other people. So at times in the album, the presentation and production sounds so big. A large part of that, if we're talking a track like movie is the strings added by string theory strings, which came as a part of multiple people working together to construct the sound. In my mind, This track in particular opens as if slowly revealing a singer in a band on stage. A turntable in the floor revolves as the strings fade in. There's feathers, it's not quite New Jersey, not quite Las Vegas, something like that. The sort of imagery is, it seems, sort of what was in mind when crafting the production. Yeah, Eric, Eric is the one who, he did did the string stuff, he um, arranged the string stuff, I did not do that for the, um, the interludes. But we had several, like, back and forth of, like, trying to figure out what the vibe was. And, I, yeah, I wanted it to be, like, a creep-in kind of thing of, like, there is a band. Surprise. So I love that, it, that that's what you saw in your head. That was exactly what I was going for. Despite only being 24, Annie has several tracks on her SoundCloud page that reflect a period she's well removed from artistically. These came as a product of her time at Southwestern, 
revealing a blueprint for what was yet to come with Dive Bar. Oh my gosh. Well, two of those songs I record, I mean, all of those songs I recorded when I was in college and um, I recorded them in the, the recording studio that they had there. And two of them, Lavender and uh, Willow Tree were both like finals for a class that I was in. And then the other song that's on my um, hallways was just like a personal one that I, I really like that song. I like to record it at re record it at some point. But I think those were kind of those were definitely like my first step into putting my writing out there in kind of a small way. I think Willow Tree is on Spotify now too. But I've always been so like insecure about my writing style and just, you know, like unsure about it and uh I always kept it to myself. And I think I think in college it was hard because there was a lot, I mean, that's like their whole thing is that they're critiquing you to make you better. And I think I took that at the time as like, it kind of like defeated me a little bit. And so I took, I didn't write, I mean, for a while after I released those songs. And then I was playing with that, that band where we were doing all cover songs for years. And then I I would every now and then bring a song to that group and we'd play it. But I don't know. I think I just had a moment where I was like, if I really want to make it as an artist, um, I have to be original and I can't just sing other people's songs for the rest of my life. I'm not going to get anywhere. And I think it was kind of just like hand in hand with my like self growth and my like self discovery of like, Oh, I do have something to say and maybe people will like it. And even if they don't, it's like enough just for me. And that is so interesting to hear. Again, falling back to this dual coexistence, this time a balance between confidence and insecurity. You can see the confidence in Annie's presentation in her music videos and hear it throughout Dive Bar. But to know that underneath there is something else going on adds another layer to the onion. And if using the onion analogy, the layers of persona associated with her music and performance surround more of a vulnerable core, or maybe something of a bulb in the center, found deep beneath multiple outside layers. I think the insecure voice used to be a lot louder. I think it's getting quieter more and more. But I do definitely have like those thoughts of like, you know, what is the point of this? You know, why am I doing this type of thoughts and things like that? But I, I don't know. I think after the release of Dive Bar, I just got such a good response. And so many people were so supportive that I, I, I just think like going into my next thing is why I feel so ready to like start being more personal in my music. Yeah, I think the the Annie persona is like something that helps me be actually confident. Like I don't I don't know if I'm like pretending when I'm being that way. Do you know what I mean? It just like it's a way to like step into that. Like I think all the time about Marilyn Monroe and like the greatest, you know, like the most beautiful women that come off as extremely confident. There's like an interview that Marilyn did where she was like walking with this journalist and then like being, you know, her normal self. And then she was like, do you want to watch me become her? And then she just like stepped into like her Marilyn persona and like totally transformed herself. And I just think about that all the time where it's like, I don't know if, if, if I can like kind of believe it somehow, it's just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like, it just feels good to like, you're kind of pretending, but then it makes it real at the same time. Do you know what I mean? I look at this as a skill to be able to make a transition like that and move freely between these different sides. In Annie's case, it's not a trait associated specifically with music, though, but one that's been honed over a lifetime of performing in front of others. Yeah, I grew up in dance, and I was always... I danced since I was four through all the way through high school, so I think that is a big reason that I kind of have that persona, where it's like, okay, I'm on stage, and I know how to be on stage and I can, you know, be whatever character I want, which is pretty fun. That playfulness and the guessing game of not always knowing whose voice it is we're hearing or which side is coming out adds depth and value to the listening experience. Looking at with a better understanding of how Annie approaches her music though, it's interesting to hear about how this split persona developed and what it provides for her outside of her music. You know, I honestly, I think I'm more insecure about the person that I am every day than the person that I am on stage. Like, I think when I'm on stage and when I'm performing and writing songs that are, like, in this character, I think that feels more me than I feel when I'm going to my daycare job. (laughs) You know what I mean? I've worked there for almost three years now, kind of on and off. I've 
I quit at one point last year and I was serving full time at a restaurant and I the daycare that I work at I love I love kids and it's like a a big part of like kind of I think my purpose is to like be like a nurturer and I like I just love kids and I love their imagination I think that is like I am still a kid in my head a little bit you know because I (laughs) I use my imagination so much when I'm writing too but one of my friends from high school works at this daycare and I kind of just like stumbled upon it because of her and that's where I met Debbie who did the interludes and I don't know it's just it's kind of it's nice because I don't know it's not a lot of Des Moines people that are in the scene no one there like really knows me that well like they do know me they do know I do music but it's not I kind of have like a different persona there you know I think that it's harder to have a conversation with one person than with a whole audience I've always been that way I think it's just like easier for me to kind of seem like larger than life in front of people it's less intimate and I think that just stems from like (laughs) intimacy issues in general but yeah I don't know it's just I just love being on stage and I think I think it's so fun and I think it's it's so like freeing and especially like when I think about how a lot of people like have a hard time being on stage and like it's just something that comes naturally to me it just makes me feel so like secure with myself somehow. I don't know. Interesting. Surely as she continues to perform and release more music, those lines are probably going to get more blurry. And from a creation standpoint, I'm curious to see how her music reflects this change as more and more people within her orbit come to know her more as Annie the performer rather than the person who works at a daycare. Annie told me that her next release will come with a full-length album that she'd like to put out later this year, and how that album will reflect more of the core self and less of the persona. With it, I'm interested in seeing if and how those two sides meet, and what they sound like when they do. Until that time comes, though, Annie will continue performing in support of Dive Bar, which includes a gross domestic product after-party set that's on the books for this April. And to wrap up our conversation, I asked what she hopes listeners might take away from the music from this stage in her journey. I hope that people um, can hear like little parts of who I am, I guess. I hope that they can hear that you can be anything that you want. I think that's kind of like what I'm telling myself throughout these songs is like, oh, I'm all these different things and I can be all of them simultaneously. And a lot of the songs, like especially Cherries, that song just like makes me feel so good about myself. I hope that people and and movie too, you know, it's like just like I love when songs make me feel indestructible. And I kind of hope that I don't know, I I, but I also elements of like dive bar, you know, I think that it's so a lot of people feel alone often. And I think that that song is kind of just like about loneliness and about being a larger than life person on stage and then feeling so lonely when you leave. And I hope, you know, people can just relate to that and to like the different elements of the songs. And I don't know, it's kind of a ride, but I, I just hope that people feel something at all. That's like always what I want when I'm singing. And I look like wine, body and move like liquid, energy so divine. Are you One more time Cause I smell like cherries And I 